Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for our seminar this evening. Today, our event is Stroke Facts from the Neurologist with Dr. Padmanaban. He is with Base Day Neurology, and he specializes in neurology and vascular neurology. He's assistant professor of neurology at University of Massachusetts Medical School, Bay State. Just want to let you all know that attendees will be muted, but you can type your questions in the Q&A box and we'll have Dr. Padmanaban review them at the end of his presentation. So welcome, Dr. Padmanaban. Thank you, Sue. Uh, thanks for having me over uh, for a beautiful afternoon or evening. Um, I'll just start with uh, some basic facts about stroke and heart attack and then uh, talk about uh, how uh, prevention works. Um, so what we know um, about uh, stroke, heart attack, or peripheral artery disease is uh, it's one and the same thing. They all belong to a category called vascular diseases. Uh, vascular meaning uh, circulation, uh, arterial circulation in specific. Uh, when it comes to the brain, uh, altered blood flow to the brain is called a stroke. Uh, heart, it's heart attack, as we all know it. And uh, when it comes to the legs or the hands, it's called peripheral artery disease, also called PAD. Um, if you look at this, it's kind of a spectrum of the same disease called vascular disease. So everything we talk about stroke today also applies to heart attack and peripheral vascular disease. So um, we'll go into some facts here. Um, Coronary artery disease or heart disease, or as you, as we all know, heart attack is a leading cause of death in the U.S. and also mostly across the world. Um, stroke is the fifth leading cause, but it happens to be the leading cause of neurological disability in the U.S. today. Um, so it is something we want to prevent, and uh, not just that, we also want to reduce disability in patients who come to us with stroke. So over the last ten years. We focus not just on stroke prevention, but also in mitigating the disability when somebody comes to us uh, either in the hospital or in the clinic with a stroke and we uh, try to reduce the consequences of the disability. What we know about the stroke um, statistics is about 800,000 strokes a year, uh, 150,000 deaths from the stroke, every, a stroke every 40 seconds. And as I mentioned, it's a leading cause of disability and the top five leading cause of death. Primary prevention, which means preventing a stroke from happening in the first place is very important. And most of the strokes that we see in the hospital, 70% of them are first time events. So there's a lot of uh, room for uh, prevention and uh, primary prevention, as we know, uh, starts with uh, preventing, modifying and mitigating what we call risk factors. Strokes do not, uh, you know, exempt anyone. It can occur at any age. Um, and we all know that strokes more often occur in older folks, three quarters of them. But over the last decade, we've had an increase in hospitalizations in patients who are younger than 65. And if you look overall between the ages of 18 and 45, about 10 to 15% of all hospitalized with stroke uh, belong to this age group. So uh, there is a shift. Um, in the uh, stroke occurrences, uh, there's a shift to younger generations. And part of this may be uh, that there is a higher likelihood of hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol being seen in much younger population. And we also know that these are uh, preventable uh, most of the time. And so, you know, there's a lot of uh, information on here that also applies to younger adults, not just uh, people above 65. What are the symptoms? So a heart attack patient usually comes in with chest tightness, fullness, squeezing pain in the center of the chest. Uh, you can get a chest discomfort, then the pain can spread to the shoulders, the neck, the jaw, uh, perspiration, a lot of other symptoms. Uh, this is when you call 911 and uh, you know follow the code heart attack protocol. Um, strokes are not that easy. Uh, they don't always come with pain. Uh, and it's sometimes hard to tell when, when somebody is having a stroke, which is why we have this acronym called the FAST acronym. Uh, P 
patients with strokes sometimes may not be able to tell they're having a stroke unless their loved ones or bystanders are able to detect certain differences in their function and body. So the FAST is the key acronym that we use to detect stroke, um, and F stands for face droop. If you see somebody having an uneven look on their face, uh, like a face drooping, arm drift, so you have them hold both their hands up in the air and one of the arms drifts down, that's a sign of a stroke. Obviously, if somebody is not able to move that side, it's very obvious uh, you cannot have them lift in the first place. Speech, speech can be both slurred speech, trouble getting the words out, or gibberish, like garbled speech. And all of these are all signs of stroke. And T stands for time, which is time to call 911. So if you're across the street from a doctor's office, you don't want to drive into the doctor's office. If you're across the street at a doctor's office, and from a hospital across the street, you don't want to drive into the hospital, you want to call 911. And the reason why is the chain of command starts by calling 911, which designates patients to come to a stroke certified center to get the right treatment at the right time and also get them in as quickly as you can. So that's very important to know because the moment 911 is called, the emergency medical services then alert the hospitals that they're going to, that a stroke is arriving. And um, a team of people, including myself, uh, are arriving at the door to greet the patient and the EMS to get them in as quickly as possible, treat them right away. And this is pretty much 24 seven at all stroke designated hospitals. So when it comes to stroke, uh, face, arm and speech, uh, maybe not as, uh, Common, uh, some people may have more than that or may have other things going on. Some people may have an acute confusion where they cannot understand what is being told to them. Um, some people can have sudden trouble seeing in one or both eyes where they lose their vision or they have double vision uh, where they cannot look without closing either eye. Um, some people can lose their balance. And when that happens, uh, that's still a stroke when it happens too quickly. Uh, anything new, like a new dizziness, staggering, loss of coordination uh, that comes out of the blue is still a cause for concern and uh, warrants 911. The last thing on here is sudden severe headache. So if somebody's never had a headache and it's the first time headache and it's like a thunderclap headache, we call it, or a sudden headache, zero to 10 in no time, and it's never happened before, that's also a cause of concern, should come to the emergency right away. Now, a lot of people with migraines might have headaches. Uh, a lot of people with tension headaches might have headaches, but the difference is this is sudden, it's severe, it's a new type of pain. So that's something to keep in mind. So what does the EMS do? Uh, they ask all these questions when they arrive uh, at the door. So it may be at home, it may be at a clinic, it may be on the road. Uh, doesn't matter where, they always follow this algorithm in Massachusetts, which is we go by something called last known well time. So in stroke, unlike heart attack, we go by what's called last known well. The reason is that most strokes are painless and oftentimes patients who have a stroke and have trouble talking may not be able to tell when their stroke began. And that makes a huge difference in how we treat those strokes. So that's something the EMS oftentimes gets to uh, asking the onlookers, the loud ones or whoever is by the patient. They also get other things. Is there any trauma to the head? They also check their glucose. As you know, one thing about EMS mandate uh, for the state of Massachusetts is every person who is having a stroke symptom gets a glucose check. A low glucose can be very much a mimic of stroke. Uh, sometimes high glucose can cause stroke-like symptoms or worse than previous stroke, but low glucose can mimic stroke, anything below 60. So it's very important to check glucose. And they always do that at bedside when they arrive. And then they go through the checklist, which is the face, arm, speech, and time, obviously, and they write all these things for us. And what they do then is they transmit this to the hospital, which is the receiving stroke designated hospital. And they give us all this information uh, securely. So no patient information is shared on the call. And we are alerted that a patient is coming in and we know to be on standby to receive the patient and get them to the scanner right away. So this is one of the reasons why um, we treat them as a 911 call is to get this chain of command 
uh, going and to get them in the ambulance right away. So what is a stroke? Like I mentioned before, stroke is an interruption in the blood supply. It can be both due to a clot that locks the artery, which is called a clotting stroke, or due to a breakage or a burst of a blood vessel, which is called a bleeding stroke, also called a hemorrhagic stroke. Not all strokes are the same. And then there is the other kind of stroke called a TIA. A TIA also called a transient ischemic attack, a little stroke or a mini stroke. Uh, there are different names to it, but the technical jargon called TIA means that the duration of the symptoms is short, maybe within minutes to an hour, not more than an hour typically. There is no permanent brain injury because when we scan the brain, we don't see lasting damage. But it's a very important thing because uh, most patients with transient stroke-like symptoms go on to have strokes usually within the first two days. So it is very important for them to be evaluated as quickly as possible. 11% of TIA patients have a stroke within three months, but if you look at the statistics, half of them within 48 hours. So we must treat TIA and stroke as a stroke and still call 911. So when it comes to stroke, again, I spoke about clotting and bleeding. Most of the time, the stroke is a clotting kind, which is about 88% of all strokes. Bleeding tends to be less common, but it can be quite devastating. Uh, especially a neurismal bleed or a ruptured blood vessel can be quite devastating. So we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, you can see how most of the strokes are clotting strokes. But on the right, right hand side of my PowerPoint, you can see something called mortality, which is a measure of how people succumb to the stroke. And you can see that hemorrhagic stroke is a small piece of the pie, but has a large share in what contributes to death or disability from stroke of this kind. So, um, you know, either way, we got to treat stroke as an emergency, but it's just uh, more devastating to have a hemorrhagic stroke or a bleeding stroke. So how do we know what kind of stroke a patient is having? Uh, that's not easy to tell by looking at a patient, not easy to tell being a doctor, looking at a stroke patient or an EMS provider or a loved one. Uh, nobody can tell. Uh, basically, what we can tell is by a CAT scan, which we do right away. Within five minutes of arrival, we get them directly to the CAT scan. And when we do a CAT scan, we may not see a clotting stroke, except when we look at the artery. In this case, we might see a bright clot in the brain. So this is a cross section of the brain scan. Uh, these are the two eyes, the right and the left. And this itself is a brain. And you can see that this portion of the brain, there is a clot going into this artery. Sometimes we may not be able to see a big clot. It may be a smaller clot. But typically, if you have a bleeding stroke, you can see it right away. So a blood looks pretty bright in here. So this is how a hemorrhage looks like. And so that's the reason why we get them to the CAT scan right away, is to first make sure that they're not having a bleeding stroke, which matters most, because then the treatment changes. Now, if they're not having a bleeding and a clotting stroke, then there's a different treatment for that. And that... Uh, is based on rapid assessment. So once we have a stroke, we do what's called a telestroke assessment uh, or an in-person assessment. So we have both at all our hospitals and pretty much all stroke certified centers have something called telestroke backup to cover the hospital. And we are, just like I'm giving this WebEx lecture, I can log into a hospital anytime, um, you know, within a few seconds and get to seeing them on the camera talking to the staff, talking to the patient, and getting the treatment going. I don't uh, have to drive in to five different hospitals at the same time. Um, uh, you know, if the weather is inclement, I can cover those hospitals, be there right at the bedside within a few minutes. So like I said, we get the CAT scan, and I can quickly see the CAT scan as it's getting done in the CAT scanner, and we have shared access to those. And in this case, a patient comes in with a clotting stroke, and you can tell that by no blood in the brain, but we can see a clot more clearly when we give the dye contrast. So everybody who comes in with a stroke gets a CAT scan followed by a CAT scan with a dye contrast. A dye contrast typically is like a contrast that is given through the IV line, which is a small uh, line that we put in the arm. The emergency medical services oftentimes gets that on the field right before they come to the hospital. And this is why EMS uh, does a lot of work for us. 
is the get, get, get the patients prepared for us so that we can get them straight to the CAT scanner. Sometimes it may be difficult to get an IV line, so we put it in the scanner, but once we have the IV line, we can get both of these back to back. Within five minutes, we have this information. And if, what you can see on this patient is the artery on this side is flowing very nicely, but you can see how there's a blockage on this side. So this person in the picture or question has a stroke that is impairing the blood circulation to the left side of the brain. Um, on a CAT scan, the left side is on your right side. It's kind of upside down. This is what we call the area of risk. If we treat this right away, the patient can not only survive, but do very well. So time is of the essence in opening up this artery. This part of the brain actually supplies something called the speech, the motor, which is a functionality and the sensation. So this patient who came in had complete loss of function on the right side, was not able to speak. And the reason why is this part of the brain that supplies has the speech, the arm, the leg, and everything in between that affects your body function. This is a devastating stroke, so to speak. So we want to get the blood flowing. And what do we do? We get them this clot busting medication if they're within the four and a half hours. So we have two clot busting medications we can give. One is an infusion called the Alteplase, which is FDA approved. And the other one is called Tenecteplase, which has been used for a long time for heart attacks, but we now have been able to use it for stroke because of all the data we've been getting. Uh, it's very easy to give. Uh, it works very quickly and it can help us get them to another procedure called removing a clot from the brain. So once we give this medicine to bust the clot, that alone may not work. We might have to remove the clot using this device. So this device is an invasive device which goes through an artery in the groin or sometimes in the wrist. So if you can... Uh, you know, if you hold up your hand, you can feel your pulse in your radial artery. Sometimes we go through that artery and we sneak a small wire up that artery. This is magnified um, like five times and it's actually a very small device. It snakes up into the artery in the brain where this clot is right there, where the arrow is pointing. And it goes right in there, captures the clot. And within five seconds of that being deployed, the blood is back into the brain. And then the surgeon brings it out and in its entirety and the blood is back. And uh, once we get the patient back to the intensive care unit, very often in 80% of the time, the patient is able to move their legs, their hands able to talk again. And uh, in a couple of days, they're able to go home. So that's the magic of this device uh, that we've been seeing. And not always. Uh, there are some cases where it doesn't work as effectively, but for most part, this works wonders. So uh, it's better than uh, treatment we have for scabies right now or most infectious diseases. It works wonderfully. So what the interventional neurosurgeon is seeing is exactly this picture. This is a picture of how the catheter device goes up the brain. This is the left eye here coming into view. This is an X-ray machine, and you can see the catheter in the left brain where the clot is. You can see the clot. There's no circulation here. There's hardly any circulation. Then you can see once the clot is removed, the circulation is back into the brain. So this is really wonderful technology. This is a very minimally invasive procedure and can be done uh, very expeditiously when they come to the hospital. And we have 24-7 catheter-guided stroke interventional neurologists or neurosurgeons who can do this um, at, uh, you know, within a very short time frame when they come to the hospital. Same thing with a carotid artery. If there's a blockage in the carotid artery that extends to the brain, uh, they can put a stent in, open the clot, go into the brain, remove the clot. Um, we have both the capabilities. Again, it all depends on type of stroke. Some cases, the stroke may be due to the carotid artery, in this case, as you can see, this left carotid artery is blocked, and then there's a stent put in which opens up that artery. Sometimes the stent may not be feasible. We tend to use surgery to clean up the artery, and that's something we do on a case-by-case. -case. Now, changing gears to bleeding strokes, which I told you was about 12% of all strokes, we sometimes uh, may be able to see the swelling with the bleed. So this is a bleed itself. Sometimes there's a lot of swelling around it. Uh, and this is an MRI, which is dark, and the swelling around it is bright. So when we see blood uh, in the brain, 
we treat it differently. We treat with a lot of medicines to help alleviate the expansion of the bleed because what we treat is very important in the first few hours. We want to get their blood pressure down, control the swelling, get them to the intensive care unit, and get them all the treatment we can. If they're on blood thinners, we get them the reversal to reverse the blood thinners. If they have discrepancy in their clotting mechanisms, we give them clotting factors to make them not bleed anymore. So uh, treatment matters, but obviously, as you can see, we can tell by a CAT scan within five minutes. So the big question, and most people have this question, do I give an aspirin when somebody has a stroke? And the answer is no. We, we all know that we give aspirin to heart attack patients, but in a stroke, you can't tell who's having a bleeding stroke. So an aspirin could be detrimental in patients who have a bleeding stroke. And the best way to treat somebody who has a stroke is to tell that they have a scan to tell which type of a stroke is to call 911. We cannot tell, uh, you know, I won't be able to tell. Um, so the best way is to have them just call 911, skip the aspirin. Now 911 can tell you if you have a concern, if it's a heart attack and a stroke, what to do in that case. But um, that's a different algorithm altogether. But most of the time, the dispatch will tell you how to treat a patient when somebody's having any of these symptoms. Now, there's another kind of stroke called a bleeding stroke that is outside the brain. This is due to a rupture of an artery called an aneurysm. And most people with aneurysms may not have any symptoms. They might go leading on their regular life. They may have no signs or symptoms of an aneurysm. And all of a sudden, they might have the worst headache of their life and might even collapse to the ground. If that happens, they need to be seen immediately in the hospital. And again, 911 call will be very important. But what we then do is just like we did on the previous case, we do a CAT scan and then we go into the artery and we clip or coil the aneurysm so that it doesn't leak the blood anymore. And then also what we do is we keep them in the intensive care unit up to seven days. They're very intense patients because they need a lot of uh, recovery. They need a lot of treatment. They're very sick. So we keep them in the intensive care unit. But typically within the first 12 hours, we tend to treat their aneurysm. That means we coil them or clip them. So all this is very important. And the next part of my lecture talks about how to prevent all these from happening. How do we prevent a stroke from happening? How do we prevent a heart attack? So what we treat is called risk factors. Treating risk factors is very important to treating heart attack, stroke, and a third thing called vascular dementia. So vascular dementia is a type of dementia that happens with progressive arterial disease. When um, cholesterol deposit or hardening of the artery, so to speak, affects the brain, just like the arteries of the heart and the legs, which is called peripheral vascular disease or coronary artery disease, you can get what's called vascular dementia, which is oftentimes not necessarily after a stroke, but can happen from small little strokes or from poor circulation to the brain. So everything that we talk about right now is going to prevent all these things from happening. So what puts people at risk for a stroke, heart attack, or vascular dementia? So things that we cannot change are age. So as we get older, we are always at risk for stroke, heart attack, um, you know, gender. Um, some people have high risk. Men might have high risk of stroke and heart attack. Estrogen in women is protective up to a certain age, but after they reach menopause and once the estrogen decreases, that gender differences tend to not have the same bearing anymore. So you might see more strokes in women as well. Uh, race is also another risk factor, but again, that is very important to keep in mind that um, hypertension and sleep apnea might be more prevalent in certain groups. So that's something about uh, things to keep in mind about race. Family history is another thing to keep in mind. Aneurysms can run in the family. So when somebody has an aneurysm, we go back to the family and see if they have any family history. And we tell their loved ones to be screened for it. Family history of stroke, heart attack at a young age can point towards uh, you know, increased risk for stroke in the future in that person. And obviously, past history. That means a person who has a stroke now may have a past history of a previous stroke that puts them at risk for a stroke. So. Those are all the things we cannot change, but we can definitely keep them in mind to help address them in more specific. And what can we do to change? Uh, things like physical inactivity. So this is called lifestyle. 
being active is the first step to recovery, but also the first step to prevention. So whether uh, you never had a stroke or a heart attack or vascular disease, being active, that means walking every day, um, you know, playing, um, you know, if you like playing golf, great. If not, walking your dog, uh, you know, going outside is very important. Uh, if the weather is inclement, you can walk inside the house, stationary bike, all those are very important. Most important cause uh, or most important risk factor, I must say, is high blood pressure, which happens to be a, a very important thing because high blood pressure is oftentimes not symptomatic. Patients may not have symptoms when they have high blood pressure. The only way to tell is to check your BP at the doctor's office or at the pharmacy, you know, wherever you have the ability to check on it. Other things like smoking, diabetes, uh, you know, high body weight, stress, high cholesterol, alcohol. We are going to go to the, go into more detail, but let's talk about very specific conditions that can increase the stroke risk. Like I said, age is something we cannot control. There's another condition called atrial fibrillation. This is a kind of condition that's an irregular heart rhythm that can be silent, but it does increase risk of stroke and it is not necessarily due to a heart attack, but it is due to a heart rhythm disorder. Sometimes uh, you may feel funny heartbeat, but sometimes patients may not feel anything. And the best way to find that out is to do a cardiac monitor. And that the doctor will tell you, um, you know, which patient needs that kind of test. Sometimes it can be due to carotid disease, where I showed you the picture about the carotid artery being narrow where that can increase the risk of stroke if it's very narrow. And the third thing that we oftentimes overlook is called sleep apnea, which increases risk of stroke. Somebody who has sleep apnea, and sleep apnea doesn't refer to just snoring. Sleep apnea refers to trouble breathing during sleep, where people cannot breathe properly, cannot get their oxygen into the brain in the night because their oxygen drops. And it can be due to trouble breathing. It can be due to trouble not initiating a breath or it can be due to a combination where uh, you know, um, you're not taking enough press or you're waking up very often because you're not breathing properly, but you don't wake up enough to know that you're not breathing properly. So uh, a sleep study can tell, and the easiest way to find out is to do a home sleep study. You know, Because of the COVID, a lot of people are worried about these kind of tests. All these tests can be done in the outpatient, and oftentimes you don't need to be admitted to the hospital to do these kind of tests. So um, in a sleep study, you can take the machine home, atrial fibrillation, you can take the machine home with you, put it on, it's a sticker or a patch. Sometimes we can uh, put a device, uh, which is like a microchip that measures the heartbeat for up to three years. So uh, you know, if you, you are somebody who has had a stroke, your loved one has a stroke, you would probably have had this already done. So what do we do about lifestyle? Uh, what can we do to prevent risk factors from taking effect or getting a hold of our uh, you know, body is to prevent in the first place. So being active, um, getting to eat better, losing weight, stop smoking if you're smoking, control your cholesterol, manage blood pressure and control blood sugar. So I know it sounds as simple, but it's not sometimes very easy uh, to do. And let's talk about those. So what do we do now is to know your numbers. Your doctor, um, is the best bet to tell you what your numbers are, your primary care doctor. And if you don't have a primary care doctor, now is the time to get one, because that's what's important to tell you what your numbers look like. So let's talk about those numbers. 30 minutes of walking every day can make a big difference. You don't have to run uh, a marathon every day. You don't have to lift heavy weights. It's just brisk walking. Five times a week is what the American Heart Association recommends. Uh, and that's all you need. And if you don't have a dog, you walk, even if you don't have one. I do, and I'm going to show you my dog, but I like to walk my dog very often. But if you can't go out because of the weather, um, you know, take a stroll inside your home, you know, climb the stairs if it's safe to do so. Uh, but activity is very important. Nutrition. A lot of people ask me about what kind of diet. And there's something called a heart-healthy diet, which is uh, consistent with the American Heart Association guidelines, which is eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, whole foods, as you know it, not processed foods, very important. The more, the better. Uh, fish, preferably white fish, has a lot of good oil called omega-3. 
uh, fiber is very important in reducing cholesterol. Um, oats, um, you know, grains, cereals have a lot of fiber and it has good carbohydrate, which is the fiber carbohydrate. So if you look at the bottle or the box, you can tell uh, what the fiber content is. Um, the carbohydrate may be a combination of the sugar plus the fiber. So you want to have more carbohydrate from the fiber, not the sugar. The other thing is the salt. So sodium less than 1.5 grams or 1500 milligrams. We want to keep away from the salt shaker. So if you have somebody who has hypertension, especially heart failure, heart disease or stroke, keep the salt shaker away. But it also applies to the general population. Uh, the first step is to not add too much salt. And sugar, like, you know, calories in beverages, like soda, that's a big no, because it just adds to weight gain. And it's preferable to use um, uh, sugars from whole grains than to get it from beverages. The other dietary measures that we have talked about are so-called you know, Mediterranean diet, which is low in saturated fat, uh, high in plant diet uh, with olive oil, nuts, legumes, seeds, and keeping the processed meats to the minimum, less than two servings a week, uh, can go a long way. And you know, obviously, diet alone is not the answer. A lot of things make a big difference, and activity with diet makes a difference. If you're smoking, now is the time to quit. I want to mention that a lot of people quit at least three to five times before they finally quit. So if you quit and you come back to smoking, don't be annoyed or upset. It's very common to quit before you quit again, and you quit again, and then you quit again. So talk to your doctor about how to quit smoking and how to cut down. Most people like to cut down or quit on their own, but some people like to be on a patch. Some people like the medicines. Um, it all depends on you know, your ability to work on this. So uh, talk to your primary care doctor about it. But quitting smoking can work right away. It reduces the risk of stroke and heart attack significantly. And in one year, it reduces that risk significantly. And by five years, if you quit smoking, it's like you never smoked when it comes to risk for stroke or heart attack. And by the end of 10 years, if you quit smoking, that risk for lung cancer is like, you never smoked at all. So that's very important to keep in mind that quitting smoking now can have very significant consequences for every passing year you still quit. Blood pressure, same thing, the lower the better. The magic number on the upper number is 140, needs to be below 140, on the lower number needs to be 90. So the upper number is called the systolic blood pressure, the lower number called the diastolic blood pressure. So you want your BP to be below 140, 90. So very important to check your BP either at the pharmacy or the primary care office. And uh, keeping it below 140, 90 is very important. Some people can do that by diet modification, lifestyle change. Some people may need medicines. And don't be frustrated because some people can have more than one medicine. They might be on three blood pressure medicines that work differently to control the blood pressure and that's how it works. Um, people might need three or more. It's just the way it is, but um, you know, sometimes it can just be in the family trait. So very important to know your blood pressure. Cholesterol has different components to it. So when you check your cholesterol with your primary care, there's something called a total cholesterol, which needs to be less than 200, but there's also something called the HDL or the healthy cholesterol. That needs to be higher. The more, the merrier. So more than 40 is good. Uh, less than 40 means uh, you know, exercise, diet modification might help. And then there's something else called the LDL, also called the lousy cholesterol. We want to have the lower level on the LDL. And that's the most important risk for stroke and heart attack when it comes to cholesterol lowering. But we also know that cholesterol lowering with medicines like statin agents has other benefits. Uh, it not only lowers your cholesterol when you get on a medicine, we also use medicines to reduce the stroke and heart attack risk by other mechanisms. That means if somebody has cholesterol deposit in their carotid arteries, we use those medicines to lower the risk of progression of those carotid arteries before we approach them with surgery. So that's another take home point for cholesterol medicine. Uh, for us, numbers are very important, but we also like to look at the health of, of the arteries when we give medications to somebody. Uh, but in general, um, the lower 
the better on the lousy cholesterol and diet modification, lifestyle, and changes to um, you know fats, unsaturated or polyunsaturated fat, very important. And if those don't work, your primary care decision, um, you know, to give you a medication to lower it is based on what we call the Framingham Heart Score, which is very widely implemented. And you can ask your score from your primary care doctor. You can ask your score about what your vascular risk score is by putting all these numbers together. Finally, this uh, diabetes is also important. So when somebody has diabetes, we tend to control their blood pressure more importantly, control their height, I'm sorry, control their weight, control their cholesterol, and get them to exercise more often and maintain their fasting sugar less than 100 as much as we can. So with diabetes, we tend to be more stringent with other, other monitoring of the numbers. Alcohol and drugs, um, if you're not drinking, don't drink. I know there is a lot of data about red wine and alcohol uh, having a good effect on the heart. But at the same time, there are some concerns about pancreatic cancer, about GI, gastrointestinal issues. So if you don't drink, don't drink, don't start. But if you do, cut down uh, to no more than two drinks. So when I say two drinks, it's about beer, not heavy alcohol. So try to cut down as much as you can. And not drinking in the first place is a good idea. Stress, obviously, a lot of people ask me, is stress a cause of stroke and heart attack? Very much so. It's not the big things. It's the small things that matter, the frustration. So always find time to relax when you're at work. and. Uh, get your sweat out by, uh, you know, taking a stroll outside or focusing on the outdoors or taking a look at your garden or, you know, uh, breathing exercises. Uh, you know, if you're into meditation, uh, those are very important. It's the small things that matters. So if you have a computer screen and you want to break your computer, that's fine. But I don't recommend doing that because, uh, you know, that's a different uh, you know, concept. I, I would recommend getting out and about. And most of my patients, I tell them, if you're looking at the computer screen too long, just look out at the horizon. And that's a good way to relax. Uh, look out the window. Especially now that we're all you know, working from home, very important. So never too late to take action. Reduce your risk of stroke and heart attack. Where can you start? Uh, go to your doctor. Take your family history with you. When you see your doctor, get your list of questions. Ask him what your risk factors are, get your numbers, and then control those numbers. And know the warning signs of stroke and heart attack. That's very important. So the stroke chain of survival, as you can see, starts by calling 911. When somebody has a stroke, um, very important to call 911, not wait uh, to get them to the clinic or call your doctor's office, just call 911. Because if they're eligible for the clot busting medication, time is very important. Every minute of time spent uh, by not opening up the artery may mean a lot of neurons. That's about 2 million neurons a minute. So that's a big you know, damage that uh, can be prevented. Same thing with TIA, also called transient ischemic attack. It's the same as a stroke, except it's short lasting and um, has a high risk of stroke. So if you've had somebody who has had short duration symptoms of say weakness, numbness, uh, that came and went and they had a face droop or a speech problem, only lasted like five minutes. Oh, I'm just going to shake it off. Don't say that. Call 911, get them into the hospital right away because that's a high risk for a disabling stroke to come within the next two days. So why do you want to call 911? Is because the hospitals in Massachusetts and now most of the country is designated as stroke certified hospitals. So when you call 911, the EMS arrives, transmits the information to the local hospital that you're bringing, and alerts people like me, uh, the pharmacy, the technicians, the ER physicians, the cardiology people, they all come to take care of the patient who arrives at the door. And like I said, every minute, um, millions of neurons are dying. So we want to treat them uh, as soon as we can, get the blood flow back to the brain. And we can do that very expeditiously up to 24 hours with great results if you can get the blood flow back into the brain. So what do you do after a stroke has happened is to expect recovery. Not all people have the same rate of recovery. So 
if you've had a loved one who's had a stroke, many people, as you know, may not have the same rate. One person might recover faster than others, but 20% demonstrate early recovery. People who are treated with these medications and uh, treatment with thrombectomy, uh, the device that I mentioned, tend to recover faster, but most patients recover uh, over a period of months. I should say more like three months is a maximal improvement, but they can take up to one year or even up to two years in some cases. So it's never too late to recover. 60 to 70% of the people take a long time to recover. The road to recovery is quite complex in many patients who had a devastating stroke. So keep in mind there's something called rehab, which we like to do right away. When somebody comes to the hospital, we start the rehab right at the hospital as we're treating a stroke. And we start with a rehab physician, occupation therapist, physical therapist, speech. And so different people need different levels of rehab. Uh, so we have a team in place. All stroke certified hospitals have a team to take care of those patients. So uh, when you go to a stroke hospital, you're not just getting the treatment, you're also getting the rehab you need. And why is it important? Is because most stroke patients cannot swallow, which means they're at risk for choking. And so 30% of the stroke patients who come to the hospital can choke on the foot. That's one of the reasons why you also don't want to give an aspirin to a stroke patient because they can choke on foot. So when somebody comes to the hospital, we get rehab services to not only do the rehab like I've shown you in the picture here, to work on their legs and arms, but also make sure that they're safe to swallow their foot. After a stroke happens, the throat becomes weak and patients may get pneumonia because the throat may not have the capacity to limit foot from entering the windpipe or the air pipe. So that's the reason why we have specialists making sure that they have the right diet and it is the right nutrition. And very important in strokes, we do not feed people with strokes. And I know people get frustrated when they're admitted and they don't get to eat and drink. But the first 24 hours, when somebody cannot swallow, we give them fluids through the IV line, keep them hydrated, and then get the speech swallow evaluation. Make sure they're able to safely swallow before they start the food. And that's also part of our program with the outpatient therapy, where we continue to follow them, not just for home therapy, but also for swallow therapy, for speech therapy, long-term care therapy, and putting them back at work, which is occupational therapy. So these are all the services we have, both inpatient and outpatient at all our rehab sites. Uh, physical therapy, which deals with walking, occupational therapy, getting you back in the community, taking care of yourself. Speech therapy is about swallowing, like I mentioned, very important, starts from day one and then goes on to the outpatient setting, communication skills. So speech therapy does one last thing. It's called cognition. Cognition means processing brain function to think, analyze, and store memory. So those things also come under speech therapy. So sometimes when we talk about speech and language, it's not just about speech, it's also about memory. Many patients who have strokes tend to have trouble with keeping track of things. So that's another thing that speech therapists are very good at. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we have stroke services the way we have built up is have these speech services be a part of that cognitive therapy. Lastly, we have something called recreation therapy, uh, which is part of, you know, cooking, gardening, trying to get your skills back. And we also not mentioned here is driving assessment, which we do at Bay State facilities. And most facilities that have a driving simulation, getting them back on their feet, we have something that is built into the therapy program where people can utilize a simulation device, uh, sit in a kind of a mock car or a bus and uh, try to handle the brakes and see how the response time is before they get on the road. So that's something we have built in with rehab services for safety, not only for the patient, but also for the community at large. Lifestyle changes for survivors. So one thing we don't include is what do the survivors go through? Survivors go through a lot more than what the patients go through. So we have a lot of challenges that survivors go through for in terms of caregivers. Um, that means people who care for stroke patients are also equally important. So caregivers 
also get equal amount of emotional anxiety taking care of their loved ones who have a stroke. So it's very important for us to address all these things. Are they needing any help at home? Can we give a break to the caregivers? Do they need respite care? All this is part and parcel of the stroke clinic and part of the rehab clinic, part of the primary care clinic. So very important to have primary care doctor on your site to address all these things because not only is about is it about getting your strength back, it's about emotions, it's about sexual intimacy, about pain, about memory, and how much can the caregiver, your loved one, take care of those stroke patients. So that's all very important. To learn more about strokes, um, there's this 188 number called 1884 Strokes. You can get online or you can go to the strokeassociation.org where there's all the stroke tips. I strongly encourage everybody to get on this website if you have a computer or a phone, uh, like a smartphone, and uh, learn the facts about stroke um, and heart attacks, and uh, learn to recognize a stroke. Fan lost is brain loss. So if you notice someone, either your loved one or somebody you know uh, is having a stroke, consider it as an emergency. Call 911, get them to the hospital, and uh, I'm all done with my presentation. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer, just like my dog who has a lot of questions on his face right here. Thank you, and uh, thanks for joining me on this uh, wonderful evening today. That was so great. Uh, can you tell us what your dog's name is? It's Leo. Leo, Leo? like the lion. <laughs> oh, well, he's beautiful. Thank you. So we do have... Um, Thank you for that comprehensive talk, by the way. That was really terrific. And I learned some things I'm sure our audience did too. And we do have um, a few questions coming in, if you don't mind. Of course. Um, could you or can you repeat the information related to testing glucose levels and low versus high levels? You know, oh, and what low versus high levels indicate? Yeah, so, um, you know, low blood sugar can sometimes mimic stroke. So, um, you know, when we uh, have a stroke patient in the field, so to speak, when emergency medical services arrive, they always check blood sugar. And the reason is that low sugars can sometimes make people comatose. Um, some people may have the shakes, uh, the sweats, to tell that they're having low sugar, but some people cannot tell low sugar. And some people can have weakness, some people can have dizziness, and some people might drift into a coma. Anything below 60 is considered low, uh, but typically some people may not have symptoms even below 50, so it's hard to tell. Um, only by checking on a glucometer, you can tell that the sugar is low when somebody has symptoms. So if you're a diabetic and you're feeling very weak or you're feeling woozy, dizzy, and sweaty and perspiring or feeling faint, make sure you check your BP and your sugar. If you have a glucometer or uh, you know, call your doctor or come to the hospital right away. Uh, high sugar, on the other hand, more than 350 or more than 400, sometimes can cause uh, certain metabolic, that means uh, electrolyte abnormalities like uh, sodium and other things to shift and might also cause a previous stroke symptom to get worse. And so high sugars not always come with stroke symptoms. They can just come with more fatigue, uh, you know, tiredness, increased urination. Uh, but it's important to also check your sugars if it's too high. If it's extremely high, patients can go into coma. And that is also important to come because it's a serious medical emergency, um, above 500. So if you're Blood glucose monitor says, you know, more than 400, that's also a reason of concern. Um, and uh, definitely if it says very high, time to come to the hospital, get it checked out. Uh, high sugar doesn't necessarily mean that high sugars cause a stroke-like symptom, but it is important to keep in mind. Diabetes, by definition, is a fasting sugar more than 100. Uh, and uh, we don't diagnose just based on fasting, but also do what's called a glucose tolerance test, which is a two-hour two uh, glucose syrup followed by a test. And we also do something called hemoglobin A1C, which is an 
which is the uh, average glucose over three months. That's more like an outpatient thing, which you talk to your primary care doctor, and the lower your hemo hemoglobin A1C, the better it is. As long as you don't have low sugar, it's important to keep in mind that you don't run into low sugars when you try to control your diabetes. So if you have diabetes, talk to your doctor, make sure you get your diet, and if you're on insulin, make sure that um, there are not certain things that can affect your sugars, especially that can make you low. And uh, many patients may not have um, symptoms even at sugars less than 60. So keep checking your glucose as per your doctor's recommendation, maybe three times a day with meals. And at bedtime, it all, it all depends on the type of diabetes you have, how well it is controlled, and how often does your primary care doctor want to check on. But uh, low sugar, uh, very low sugar can sometimes mimic a stroke. So coming back to the point, if you have a low sugar and the EMS arrives and the sugar is very low and they're having stroke symptoms, the EMS has a hand kit ready in their box of other things to give. They have a glucose injection they can give right away. And when they do that, it's life-saving. And sometimes people come out of their coma right there and they do very well, but they still bring them to the hospital making sure that they're recovering and they're not having any more symptoms. So it's not unusual to um, you know, have symptoms even after the glucose is improved, but typically um, you know, we wanna treat them right away and not wait till they get to the hospital, especially very low sugars. Thank you for that. Next question, do you recommend supplementing with folic acid in B12 to help lower risk, uh, stroke risk? Very good question. There's something called high homocysteine levels. And homocysteine is a chemical uh, enzyme um, that plays a role in the vitamin pathway, especially folic acid and vitamin B12. High homocysteine has a link with stroke. But when we give multivitamins in high doses like folic acid, vitamin B12, or pyridoxine, which is B6, it did not make a difference. It did not actually reduce risk of stroke. So we don't know. We don't have data. So my recommendation is if you have a number that you're going to follow with your primary care and he's checked your number, say a B12 number or a folic acid number, uh, say suppose for anemia or neuropathy or other causes, or even otherwise he's checking your number, you can check on it and correct the deficiency. But uh, we don't have data on taking high doses as of right now, because no trials have indicated that high doses of B-complex or folic acid actually prevent a stroke from happening. Hmm. Thank you for that. Um, another question, could a concussion or head injury cause a stroke? Uh, so a head injury or concussion doesn't actually cause a stroke, but it actually causes some of the deleterious effects that we see with a stroke which is memory loss, um, cognitive difficulties, uh, mood pattern changes. Uh, sometimes they can have dizziness and loss of balance from concussion, which can mimic a stroke. So it is very important to come to the hospital when after a concussion or after a head injury, a person is not recovered or back to normal. In any case, if there's head injury, we always recommend, recommend patients coming to the hospital to have them checked out. and. Uh, we have certain guidelines, but uh, concussion in itself does not cause a stroke, but there's another mechanism. Trauma to the neck, for example, from head injury or from a motor vehicle collision like a whiplash can cause something called a tear in the artery called a dissection, which is a carotid artery that runs in the neck. And that tear can then give rise to a clotting stroke because the tear in the artery can block the artery from going giving blood to the brain that's essential to that part of the brain. So that's the only connection between trauma and stroke. Thank you. Um, this isn't a question, but it is a comment. Uh, thank you, Dr. Padmanaban. You are an awesome physician. You have always provided great care to me. Of course, thank you. That's very <laughs> nice. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I believe... I believe that is all the questions then for the talk um, and we're close to end time. So I would like to thank you very much for this comprehensive talk and for your great 
answers. And oh, someone else is saying thank you as well. So thank you to you, doctor. Welcome. Thank you.